Dear friends, recently I heard an opinion. In the last two years, not a single Ukrainian has been killed in Russia proper simply for being Ukrainian. Therefore, it's not a genocide and the Ukrainians have nothing to worry about. Hmm. It's an interesting statement and we need to take a closer look at this claim. Can Ukrainians live in Russia? I'll try to answer this question by telling you a tragic story of a double genocide. In fact, it was the largest genocide in the 19th century. And you probably never even heard the name of the country it took place in. Before we delve into today's episode, let's begin with a fundamental understanding of the term synonymous with the worst human suffering. Genocide. The term genocide was coined by Raphael Lemkin in 1944. It refers to the intentional and systematic destruction of a racial, ethnic, religious or national group. It involves acts committed with the intent to annihilate, either in whole or in part, a targeted population. Raphael Lemkin specifically included the Holodomor as the example of genocide in his writings, but we won't speak about it today. Today, I want to speak about another horrific instance of genocide, which Ukrainians might actually be partially responsible for. Genocidal actions can manifest in various forms, including mass killing, forced deportations and the eradication of cultural identity. Please note the last part, eradication of cultural identity. Genocides leave deep scars on the survivors, haunting the collective memory with stories of unimaginable pain and loss for generations. In fact, the consequences of genocide persist even after the killing stops. Once the genocide is committed, I would argue, the stable institutions are no longer viable because the perception of risk and priorities is too distorted to do something as mundane as paying taxes or saving for the retirement. Let's take 1944 for example. The Nazis are kicked out from Eastern Europe and the Russians who replace them commit a series of genocides. Deportation of the Chechens and Ingush from their land. Between one quarter and 50% of them died in the process. A very similar thing happened the same year to the Crimean Tatars. Between 18 to 46% of them perished during the 1944 deportation. All you have to do is to displace them forcibly and they'll die inevitably in the process. It's a common tactic employed in different genocides around the world. Now, armed with a deeper understanding of the term, let's embark on our exploration of the main topic of today's podcast, the Circassian genocide. Chances are that you have never heard about this important story. Circassians are an indigenous nation native to the historic country of Circassia in the North Caucasus to the east of Crimea. Basically, if you look at the map, it's just to the east of Crimea. The last capital and the largest city is Sochi. It's where the Russians organized the Winter Olympics just before invading Ukraine in 2014. As a consequence of the Circassian genocide perpetrated by the Russian Empire in the 19th century during the Russo-Circassian War, most Circassians were exiled from their homes to modern-day Turkey and the rest of the Middle East. Currently, there are as many as 3.7 million Circassians in diaspora in over 50 countries. So, what exactly happened to them and why this story is worth hearing? The Circassian genocide was a systematic mass murder and expulsion of 95-97% to 97 of Circassian population by the Russian Empire, resulting in 1-1.5 to 1 million deaths. Killing methods used by the Russians during the genocide, including impaling and tearing the bellies of pregnant women as means of 
intimidating of the Circassian population. Russian generals such as Grigory Zas described the Circassians as quote unquote subhuman filth and glorified the mass murder of Circassians, justified their use in scientific experiments and allowed his soldiers to rape women. The Russian government developed a genocidal strategy of massacring civilians. Only a small percentage who accepted Russification and resettlement within the Russian Empire were spared. The remaining Circassian population who refused were killed en masse. Circassian villages would be located and burned, systematically starved, and their entire population massacred. William Palgrave, a British diplomat who witnessed the events, wrote that, quote, their only crime was not being Russian, end of quote. In 1864, a petition from Circassian leaders to Her Majesty Queen Victoria was signed requesting humanitarian aid from the British Empire. In the same year, mass deportation was launched against the surviving population and it was mostly completed by 1867. Calculations, including taking into account the Russian government's own archival figures, have estimated a loss of 94 to 97 percent of the Circassian population in the process. Ottoman archives show more than 1 million migrants entering their land from the Caucasus by 1879, with nearly half of them dying on shores as a result of diseases. If Ottoman archives are correct, it would make this the biggest genocide of the 19th century. In confirmation of Ottoman archives, Russian records documented only the presence of around 100,000 Circassians in the region following the events of genocide. Other estimates by the Russian historiographers are even lower, with figures ranging from 40 to 60,000. As of 2023, Georgia is the only country to recognize the Circassian genocide. Russia actively denies the Circassian genocide and classifies the events as a, quote, migration, end of quote. Very cynical. Some Russian nationalists in the Caucasus continue to celebrate the day when the Circassian deportation was launched, 21st of May each year, as, quote, holy conquest day, end of quote. Circassians commemorate 21st of May every year as the Circassian Day of Mourning. On May 21st, Circassians all over the world protest against the Russian government. Why would the Russians do it? What could possibly motivate them to commit this genocide? Tsardom of Moscow is the historic heartland of what you call Russia. Before the start of its expansion in the 15th century, it was essentially a landlocked country. Muscovites are obsessed with expansion. Especially, they have a thing for reaching a sea or an ocean. They want to reach them all. Side note. Hi there. Are you listening to us from Portugal, Spain or France? Do you still think that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is too far from you? Good luck to you thinking this way. Back to the story. On their way to the Indian Ocean, which they almost reached during the invasion of Afghanistan, but it's a part of a different story. They had to pass by the Caucasus. And they encountered a fierce resistance. As the answer to this resistance, the Russians massacred the indigenous people of the region. The Russians do their crimes slowly. The genocide lasted for 70 years under five different monarchs. Let me guide you through the timeline. This expansion started during the reign of Catherine the Great in the late 18th century. In the Caucasus, the local people opposed the Russian expansion and in return faced the brutal tactics of the Russian Empire. Russian generals orchestrated a series of devastating raids against the Circassian people, using ruthless methods to subdue and control the local population. 
The atrocity started in 1799, when General Fyodor Bursak led raids burning Circassian villages, and then General Pavel Tsitsyanov continued his campaign from 1802 to 1806, referring to the Circassians as, quote, untrustworthy swine, end of quote. In 1805, a plague hit Kabardia, another name for Eastern Circassia, providing General Glazenab with an excuse to order the burning of 80 villages. This brutal tactic aimed to terrorize the people into submission. The Russian army implemented a village burning campaign, sparing no one. While looting Circassian villages, they killed those who resisted and then set the village ablaze, ensuring that no one survived. Between 1805 and 1807, General Bulgakov's army alone burned over 280 villages, drastically reducing the population of Kabardia. In 1810, a Russian state commission decided to eliminate the Circassians from their homeland. General Yermolov, arriving in 1817, made terror an official strategy. Circassian villages and towns were destroyed, and people were slaughtered as part of an effort to shock the population into surrender. Under Yermolov's order, Russian troops systematically destroyed crops and livestock, killing Circassian farmers. Villages resisting the Russian rule faced destruction, with an explicit warning from General Del Pozzo that no mercy would be shown. Despite these brutal tactics, Circassian resistance persisted. Villages accepting Russian rule were terrorized anyway, and they had no choice but to resume resisting. In September 1820, forced resettlement began, with Russian forces entering Kabardia, killing cattle and causing mass exodus into the mountains. The entire Kabardia, eastern Circassia, was declared property of the Russian government, and this land was given to the Cossacks of Kuban to settle there. Stay with me, this is an interesting part. Who were those people whom the empire wanted to settle instead of Circassians? A long story short, they were Ukrainians. 45 years prior to those events, Catherine the Great banned the Ukrainian army. Those Ukrainian soldiers, called Cossacks, were displaced to a couple of different places. Eventually, some of them moved by the imperial government to the land where the Russian Empire massacred Circassians. Initially, they settled north of the river Kuban, but moved south under the imperial decree. We'll come back to it later. It's an important part of the story. In the 1820, General Yermolov accelerated his efforts in Kabardia, destroying 14 villages in March 1822. In February 1824, General Vlasov attacked Circassian villages including Jambut, Aslan, Morza and Tsabdadhika, despite their peaceful coexistence with the Russian Empire. They posed no threat to the Russians whatsoever. The violence continued in 1828, when General Emmanuel destroyed and burned over 200 more Circassian villages. The Russians wouldn't even talk to the people they were exterminating. Instead, the Russians wanted to talk to the great powers. They wanted to split the land between the empires and signed the Treaty of Adrianople in 1829. The Ottomans ceded Circassia to Russia, but this treaty was rejected by Circassians themselves, who considered it invalid, as their territory had been independent and not a part of any empire. Does it remind you of anything? Circassian ambassadors sought support from England, France and the Ottomans, denying the treaty under all conditions, but their voices were not heard. In 1831, the Russian government considered destroying the Natuhai tribe to populate their land with the Cossacks. General Frolov launched a horror campaign, including artillery bombardment and the destruction of villages. Russian military commanders, including Yermolov and Bulgakov, grabbed Circassian land and showed no regards for the Circassian people themselves. Deceptive tactics, false promises and obscure peace treaties became standard practices. But the worst was still to come. 
In 1833, Colonel Grigory Zas, a racist and ruthless military commander, continued the genocide. He practiced horrific methods, including burning people alive, mass rape of children, and keeping body parts as trophies. His brutal strategies aimed to terrorize and drive away the Circassians, whom he referred as, quote, savages and bandits, end of quote. By the way, the same wording was used in the 1990s against the Chechens. Thus led expedition into Circassian territory, destroying villages and towns between 1833 and 1835. His forces engaged in mass murder, burning settlements and seizing cattle, all while glorifying the destruction in his reports. In one of his reports, Zas described capturing Circassians who refused to surrender voluntarily, ordering their execution. He then details the destruction of a neighborhood, with the Russian forces causing panic among the residents, forcing them to flee into the forest. The Cossacks, soldiers and artillery continued the onslaught, leaving the neighborhood in ruins. The atrocities reached unthinkable levels as Zas reportedly burns Circassian boys and men alive for entertainment. His cruelty extends to cutting the bellies of pregnant women with bayonet. Zas goes further, sending severed Circassian heads to friends in Berlin or using them for anatomical studies. Corpses are decapitated on the battlefield and thus keeps the heads as trophies. Make no mistake, it was not some rogue general. All of this was officially approved by the Russian government. Zas is depicted as the devil in Circassian folklore. He operated with shocking cruelty until his removal from service in 1942. However, the campaign of terror and violence continued under the new leadership. In 1837, some Circassian leaders offered the Russians a white peace, seeking to end the bloodshed. In response, General Yermolo, under Russian command, burns 36 Circassian villages, intensifying the cycle of destruction. Yermolo said, I desire that the terror of my name shall guard our frontiers more potently than chains of fortresses. During his period, the Russian cultural icons such as Pushkin and Lermontov traveled to the Caucasus to glorify the Russian crimes. Pushkin, for example, wrote Prisoner of the Caucasus, a narrative poem in which a Circassian girl falls in love with a Russian prisoner of war who is too brooding and cynical to return her feelings until she risks her life to set him free. At which point, he asks her to go with him to Russia. She cannot. She gets depressed and drowns herself instead. In the epilogue, Pushkin is not hiding his message. He implies that the Circassian girl's fate is that of the North Caucasus people in general. The scariest line is, quote, Submit Caucasus. Yermolov is coming. The same Yermolov that I just described. He is the war criminal who wished his name was synonymous with terror. If some of you think that it was acceptable by the standards of that time, you're wrong, it wasn't. Pushkin was criticized by some of his liberal friends, such as Vyasensev, for glorifying the war criminals. Another example is Lev Tolstoy, a great Russian writer who was a pacifist and he disapproved of the methods of the Russian troops. At the same time, he supported the policy of annexing the Caucasus to Russia, but not by violent means. In the story, Haji Murat, he shows that it was the cruelty of the Russian troops that pushed the locals into armed resistance to the Russian expansion. A Russian liberal is a special kind of impotent. And some years later, in 1845, 
The Ukrainian national poet Taras Shevchenko dedicated a poem to the brave people of Caucasus. And glory, freedom's nights to you, whom God will not forsake. Keep fighting, you are sure to win. God helps you in your fight. For fame and freedom march with you, and right is on your side. As you might imagine, he was persecuted for this poem. I believe it's a good example of the difference between Ukrainian culture and so-called Russian culture. All this time, the people of Cherkisha keep trying to reason with the Russians to stop the genocide. In the negotiations leading to their 1856 Treaty of Paris, attempts by the British representative to defend Circassian rights were declined. The final treaty places Circassians under the Russian sovereignty, denying them the same rights as Russian citizens in Russia. Do you still believe in negotiating with the Russians? Russian sovereignty over Circassia only accelerated the genocide, and the 1860s were the bloodiest years. By 1861, Russian Tsar Alexander II officially sanctions the extermination campaign against the Circassians. He orders the establishment of Russian Christian settlements in Circassia's lands. In the 1960s, the Russian government, led by figures like Count Nikolai Yevdokimov and Dmitry Milutin, endorsed mass expulsion and extermination of Circassians. They claimed that the goal was to, quote, cleanse the land of hostile elements, end of quote. And this ideology became an official policy. The military commanders organized massacres and ethnic cleansing. Milutin's plan focused on eliminating the Circassians as an end in itself, and the Russian army engaged the systematic destruction of the Circassian settlements. In 1962, the order to deport Circassians was issued, but the Russian commanders preferred massacres over relocation. Reports from that year indicate systematic destruction with villages burned, population massacred and entire regions depopulated. In 1864, the tragic events in Circassia took an even darker turn. The valley of Hods near Maikop becomes a battleground where the Upuch population makes a desperate stand against the advancing Russian troops. Women join the fight alongside men, discarding their jewelry into the river and taking up arms for the last stand. General Yevdokimov orchestrates a brutal assault. The Russian Imperial Army surrounds the valley bombarding it from all directions with heavy artillery. The indiscriminate killing lasts for several days, resulting in a scene described by the Circassian Chronicles as, quote, a sea of blood. Men, women and children are mercilessly slaughtered. The Russians go beyond their regular brutal acts and use cannon shells to target Circassian children for entertainment. The resistance in Hoz represents one of the final acts of defiance. As Circassian armies, surrounded and refusing surrender, opt for mass suicide instead. At approximately the same time, in a battle of Kbada in 1864, a combined Circassian forces face a massive Russian army of 100,000, consisting of Cossacks, many of whom were Ukrainians, and Imperial Russian forces. The Circassians, comprising of local villagers and militia, are defeated. Thousands are driven to the last capital of Sochi, where many die while awaiting deportation. The last packets of coastal resistance are systematically defeated, leading to mass killing of men, women and children. The Russian army celebrates victory with a military and religious parade, publicly mutilating 100 Circassian warriors in a gruesome display of authority. That's what you need to know about the Russian religion. Following the military victory, the Russian army it intensifies its efforts to burn remaining villages. They burn fields, they cut down trees, ecocide, 
is another thing the Russians are good at. By the end of 1864, the Russians removed practically all Circassians from their former settlements, setting the stage for a new population to replace them. During the genocide, the Ottoman Empire, hoping to increase Muslim population, invites the survivors to go to Turkey, promising acceptance and better life. Russia approves of this decision and General Yevdokimov is entrusted with enforcing the mass Circassian migration. Again, I cannot miss the obvious analogy with the Ukrainian refugee situation. Circassians face dire conditions during their deportation. Crowded and overloaded ships, referred as floating graveyards, become breeding grounds for diseases. Many overloaded ships sink before reaching the coast. Witnesses describe scenes of death, hunger, and diseases among the deportees. Russian forces under Yevdokimov drive Circassians to the coast, overwhelming the Ottoman capacity to accept the deportees. The Ottomans plead to stop the deportations on humanitarian grounds, but the Russians refuse the request. Moreover, Yevdokimov accelerates deportations until there are no Circassian settlements left. The tragedy continues, with many exhausted Circassians dying on the Ottoman shores upon arrival or during the journey. So, what do the Russians have to say about it? In contemporary Russia, the issue of the Circassian genocide is a contested topic. A presidential commission has been established to address the events of the 1860s with a notable focus on denying the characterization of these events as genocide. The Russian government expresses concerns that acknowledging the events as genocide could lead to potential claims for financial compensations. Furthermore, there are fears of repatriation of the diaspora back to Circassia. Former Russian President Boris Yeltsin, in a statement made in May 1994, acknowledged the legitimacy of Circassian resistance against the imperial forces. Yeltsin recognized the existence of, quote, sad casualties, end of quote, during these historical events, but did not attribute any guilt to the imperial government for the genocide. This genocide took place under the rule of five different Russian monarchs, all of them backed it politically. And after two revolutions, the Russians still don't recognize it. So do you still believe that once Putin is gone, the war will be over? Let's go back to the Ukrainians living in Circassia under Russian sovereignty. What happened to them? It was the question I started this podcast with. Can Ukrainians live under the Russian rule? After the genocide, the Kuban region expanded to the territory of former Circassia. After the collapse of the Russian Empire in 1917, a temporary Kuban military government was formed. During this period, the Ukrainian culture thrived. Ukrainian language schools opened, and six newspapers began to publish in Ukrainian. In May 1918, a delegation headed by the head of the Kuban Rada, Ryabovol, visited Kyiv. Diplomatic ties were announced between the Kuban People's Republic and the Ukrainian People's Republic. There were talks of integrating Kuban into Ukraine. But, as you know, Eventually, Bolsheviks won and took control over both Kuban and Ukraine. At the beginning of the Bolshevik rule, there was a period when the Ukrainian language was tolerated, but this policy was officially reversed in a decree on 26 December 1932. In this decree, there was a two-week deadline to switch all publications from Ukrainian to Russian and the Ukrainian language was effectively banned in Kuban until 1991. A representative of the Ukrainian state publishing house claimed 1,500 Ukrainian teachers in the Kuban were either killed or deported. The professional Ukrainian theater in Krasnodar 
was closed. All Ukrainian toponyms in the Kuban, which reflected the areas from which the first Ukrainian settlers had moved, were changed to Russian names, erasing any memory of Ukraine. Russification, Holodomor of 1932-33, and other tactics used by the Russian government led to a catastrophic fall in the population that self-identified as being Ukrainian. Kuban Ukrainian population declined from 915,000 in 1926 to only 150,000 in 1939. It's a six-fold decrease. Official Soviet Union statistics of 1959 state that Ukrainians made up 4% of the population. In 1989, 3%, and they were only 0.9% in 2002. And as of 2024, I assume no one dares to speak or even to self-identify as Ukrainian in Kuban anymore. And make no mistake, the same is happening now to the Ukrainian territories under the Russian occupation. By some estimates, over a quarter of the population of Crimea did not live there before 2014. The Ukrainian language is not taught in schools, and the history and geography lessons are replaced by the Russian lies. Recall the definition of genocide. Mass killing is not the only way to commit it. Cultural eradication is another form of genocide. So, as you can see, those Ukrainians living under the Russian rule were used as a tool by the empire. They were displaced to other people's land to help the empire with its genocide of the Cherkessians. And then they became victims of the genocide themselves. This is what I call a curious case of double genocide. Some of them were killed and the remaining ones were stripped of their cultural identity and made ashamed of their Ukrainian roots. Even worse, nowadays, the young boys from Kuban are forcibly recruited into the Russian army and sent to kill people in the land of their ancestors. This is the real culture of what you call Russia. So, no, the answer is no. The Ukrainians cannot live safely under the Russian rule. A Ukrainian state within the sovereign Ukrainian territory is the only organization that is the most likely to guarantee the safety of Ukrainians. The safety of Ukrainians also means not being used as a tool in Russia's imperial conquest, not being used in Russia's ambition to reach the Atlantic Ocean, for example. Unfortunately, the empire is too strong. So, Ukraine cannot do it without the help of our Western partners. Ukraine cannot do it without you and the rest of the civilized world. During the elections this year, please make sure that your political representative has Ukraine on his or her electoral campaign agenda. And, above all, keep donating to the Ukrainian cause. Your donations make a huge difference. For $400, there might be an FPV drone assembled. And because of your donation, a 3 million Russian tank can be taken out of service. Just imagine how many lives will be saved when this death machine is rendered inoperative. The links to trusted charities are in the description below. Thank you for listening and thank you for your generosity. Bye.